trillion rands that gets uh, to be allocated in the division of revenue, only 9% comes to local government uh, directly as well as your grants, conditional grants. Um, but um, we believe that you've got to really do away with the provincial sphere of government. In the case of Gauteng, the model must become a megapolis, a global city region where you try to marshal the fiscal muscle of the entire province, which in the current financial capabilities uh, will be in excess of 380 billion rands. And in the short, medium short term, you're talking about over 1 trillion to 1.1 trillion rands. That gives you enough muscle to bargain in the world for mega infrastructure projects. And as we know, I mean, uh, the infrastructure of Gauteng does not give it an international edge as a global city. Water infrastructure, transport, roads and transport, electricity or energy, you've got an opportunity through marshalling the fiscal resources at the center yeah. to really move at a fast pace in the way that East Asian economies have managed to build their infrastructures, not just that, but also what we've seen with uh, Arab countries as well, uh, so that you've got a, a proper capacity for business to take place, for a lot of productive activity to take place, cultural activity as well yeah. of international uh, of international skills. So, I mean, one would listen to that and imagine that it, it would firstly need a, a quite an extensive amendment to the constitution for it to be to be realized in, in the way that uh, you, you're expressing it now because you've got issues of um, uh, coherence when it comes to legislation, uh, depending on what uh, uh, National is putting in place on the social uh, area, education, health uh, uh, and transport uh, and, and, and what province would, would want to do. How would it work? Well, of course, these are national and provincial government elections. It's precisely the time to canvass the idea. It is good for economic freedom. The problems that we have at the moment require economic solutions because our country has stagnated. In some instances, it is experiencing, at least for the last over three decades, deindustrialization. Unemployment has been chronic. We've had high levels of unemployment since the late 1980s. So you need solutions that are going to unblock the productive capability of South Africa, lead to more participation in production. In many cases, we are still in the second industrial revolution. We still need to build power stations. Uh, we still need to build a lot of road infrastructure. We still need to build trains and so on and so forth. So, uh, but those will not be fundamental constitutional changes because you still believe in the separation of powers. You still believe in one woman, one man, one vote. It's not really in that aspect of the constitutional amendments. It's about administration. And if the administration of Gauteng leads us to faster economic development, economic growth, and the resolution of inequalities, we certainly feel very strong that that's precisely the, uh, the, 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 the route we should take. You know, during apartheid, there were only four provinces and majority of industrial and administrative capability and investment happen at the local state. Yeah. That's where, that is the coal face of service delivery. Yeah. And delivering services itself has a, a lot of economic potential. There's so many jobs that are immediately possible if you build internal state capacity, do away with the tenders. Don't give people EPWPs, give them permanent jobs, secure jobs so that they build and maintain roads, yeah. so that the security guards, the cleaners have proper contracts. And that means buying power in the hands of majority of the citizens. Once they've got buying power, anybody that wants to do business will come here because yeah. the people here have buying power. But the current arrangement keeps money in the hands of few people, majority of which is spent in Europe yes. through the European cars uh, and through expensive products that so money is in the bag, it goes to Europe, or yeah. it goes to China, and so on and so forth. You've got to circulate majority of the currency in the local economy, at least more how, than seven how, times. How would that work in, in, in real practical terms? Let's take, for example, the challenge that Pick It Up is having. If mm -hmm. you are now the head of this uh, city region with Johannesburg facing this, this, this challenge, uh, which is labor-related, uh, mm -hmm. and it's, it's ending up, of course, affecting waste management. Well, the current configuration depends so much on outsourcing of the delivery of services. Do you know, it's so catastrophic because these tenderpreneurs, because they are on the payroll and they work on the basis of there being problems in the infrastructure, they damage the infrastructure. 
They go and block sewers. They've damaged the infrastructure of water, for an example, in Mamilodi. The people of Mamilodi have not had water for a couple of years. You've got brand new water tanks that are delivering water. That's a business. Yeah. So in an instance where you do away with the tenders, you hire people directly and they deliver services, no one is going to damage the infrastructure because they know we're well, not going to call a tender premier. Workers of the municipality are going to go and fix the problem. And that will have to be done on proper wages. Mm -hmm. So the configuration of the budget of Johannesburg will be the interest of building internal state capacity. So waste collectors will get proper wages, the wages that they deserve and the wages that will expect them to work as qualitatively as possible to make the city clean. One would say, why have you not tried that thing? I mean, in, in, in Ekurulin, let's, at least there we know you're in charge of treasure. Mm -hmm. why, why didn't you not cancel tenders completely? Because part of the issues that uh, the Ekurulin the EFF had to deal with there was the issue of waste pickers themselves, actually. Trucks went disappearing, they found Absolutely. them again. And, 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 and the tenders are still a big thing, tenders for for. for cutting grass mm. and, and fixing fences and, and the like. Why don't you get in there and abolish tenders completely? Well, we have. The, 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 there has to be a council resolution. And uh, the council has taken a resolution to that effect. And that resolution is going to be followed through. But the current contracts have to end. So there is a process in place in Eguruleni for massive insourcing of workers. In Johannesburg, we are the ones, by the way, and I think South Africans have got to hear the truth and accept the truth that were the ones that forced him and Mashaba kicking and screaming against the interest of the DA at the time uh, to insource security guards in Johannesburg. And when they did the math, they realized not only are, going, are they going to, to save money, they're going to be able to hire more workers, increase wages. Those security guards earn between 12 and 14,000 rand. Imagine a household. In, if, if every household had a person earning between 15 and 20,000 rands, yeah. uh, that's buying power. They're not going to buy Ferraris and German cars. They're going to extend their homes. Once they extend their homes, that means brick factories, that means cement factories. There's going to be a trickling down effect. That's how you build an economy. That's how you build particularly a productive economy in which we produce the goods that are circulating as a... Uh, uh, in the market. Yeah. You, you say when you come in, the, the wardens you will incorporate into the proper police force. Uh, we need boots on the ground. Mm -hmm. But you're saying the rest of the Nasispani folks, uh, maybe some of those who are hired to, to put in solar systems and, and so on and so forth, you're going to get rid of them. Are you saying those jobs are not important? No, no, not really. We're saying that the ANC has had an electoral propaganda misleading program. Uh, because they are desperate. Um, and I don't think we should mislead South Africans. You'll have July unrest extended over years. Uh, In-service training is not a job. Uh, it's a short-term contract, uh, three months. So the majority of the non Hispanic promises are like those food parcels that come out during elections. After elections, they disappear. They are meant like an opium to put our people into sleep so that they don't seek change. You've had chronic unemployment for over 30 years. And I'm saying to you, the evidence of job creation is factories. You've got to open factories. Both post-war Europe, uh, apartheid, in the 1930s, Afrikaners in South Africa were responsible for less than 7% of South Africa's GDP. They were the poorest whites in the world. They were an embarrassment to the white supremacist culture. How did they get exhumed out of that state of economic devastation? Apartheid used parastatals, job reservations, to exhume them, distributed land, forcefully removed South African aboriginals, African people, gave them land for free, and employed them in huge parastatals. They got skilled, they got educated. Over 60 years, a new class emerged yeah. of the middle class, of SMMEs, and majority of their SMMEs, Tabo, were engaged in production, in the production of goods. Yeah. They were engaged in textile industry, they were engaged in engineering, and so on and so forth. So you've got to build internal state capacity, use parastatals to exhume the block population out of one, landlessness, 
out of poverty, and then the economy is going to be rejuvenated. Right. But secondly, you've got to do industry. Right. You've got to build factories. Nancy Span is not a solution. The solution are the factories, and the factories are in the manifesto of the EFF. We'll talk a little bit more about that, that economic uh, plan that you have. Coming up still, uh, at about you've mentioned it, it's based on uh, building state capacity, right? Mm -hmm. But two is based on at least the key pillars, but there's more. The protection of particular industries mm -hmm. and, and, and allowing those, those, those industries to thrive. Let's stick with that a little bit. Some people would say, well, is that not the same thing that people are asking for when they say protect South African jobs? Well, it, it certainly is, uh, but um, you cannot protect the jobs you don't have. You've got to create jobs. And in a natural uh, process of creating jobs, then you will be able to prioritize South Africans. But you've got to create jobs. And as you say, um, you know, the actually policy of in protection of infant industries comes from the United States. The same United States that when it got developed, it kicked away the ladder and said, don't protect infant industries. For them to come above and outdo the European economies in the 1800s, they had to do protection of infant industries. I give examples, for an example, with our plastic sector, because the, the raw material of plastic is available here in South Africa. In Sassol's process of turning coal into petrol, they've got a byproduct of plastic. It goes overseas, it comes back as finished products that don't really need degrees. Those factories where the plastic chairs are being made, where the fucking knives, the Tupperware is being made, this plastic where it's being made, they don't really need sophisticated skills. You learn on the job. It's like doing garden. You learn on the job. Majority of garden workers never went to college to learn how to do garden. So that's an example of an industry that you protect until it is competent and it's large enough for international competition. Those are the types of jobs that we're going to do. You've got to revitalize the mines, not just the gold mines. You've got to look at uh, the mining of clay because there are a lot of clay products, particularly in the construction sector, in the high earning houses, uh, as well as uh, limestone. Yeah. Those mines are possible right here in Gauteng. Yeah. So you do a list of products that you can have a competitive advantage of yeah. and list them, sit down, you list them as government and say, we're going to protect these ones through tariffs, high tariffs as well as some subsidies and make sure that they grow, but they are labor intensive at the same time. They're going to be able to give you sustainable jobs. No one is going to come from China and suddenly evidence is in the last 30 years from China, from Europe and create jobs for you. We've got to do it ourselves. One would say then, how, how does that work in the context, of course, of macroeconomics and, 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 and geopolitics where it, it needs to be a quid pro quo kind of situation? So also in the context of regional economy, which, which, which you speak about, when you say chickens from the United States are not going to come and they say, well, grapes from South Africa are not going to come. How do you deal with that? I, I, I really believe that the geopolitics are changing and the advantage certainly against the unipolar world, against the one, you know, as the one political party system is ending in South Africa, so is the one domination of the United States and its Washington recommendations, what is called Washington Consensus. Yeah. The world is becoming multipolar. There are so many partners, there are so many paths that are possible in that reality. But one of the interesting things is the stability of the African continent. It is in the best interest of South Africa's economic success for Africa to be stable, because that is the only market that is not tapped. The Asian markets are already saturated. Uh, China, India, Europe, North America. The only market that is not saturated, which is your market, is Africa. Over one billion consumers. So the products that we have here if you do a regional integration strategy in relation to trade, you have a market, a large market in the continent where you can sell your products. It's in the interest of South Africa and its economic success that there is stability firstly in SADC and the rest of the continent because those people are your potential consumers. Yeah. People say, well, South Africa might be interested in the stability. These are the partners that you want in this regional 
uh, uh, trade agreement might not be as interested in stability. There are coups left, right and centre. Uh, there, there are issues of, of, of leadership and leaders who, who don't want to uh, follow democratic processes and so mm -hmm. on and so forth. And then there are people who end up running to South Africa. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I think that um, you, the coups that you're talking about are, are in the, in the east. Yes, in the east. But um, in SADC, there's been very r relative stable region good democratic elections across the board. There's uh, constant uh, elections. The majority of the leaders in the region are elected. Uh, they've got separation of powers and so on and so forth. You don't start big, you start small. And uh, many people think when the EFF talks about regional integration, they bastardize it like, you know, open border, that when we take over, you're going to open the border immediately. No, you wouldn't. Even in our manifesto, the, we, we deliberately use the word gradual because that has to be in conversation with citizens of other countries. It has to be in conversation with these common programs of economic stability. But already, we depend so much on the region for our water. Here in Johannesburg, the water comes from Lesotho. We have a big electricity problem. The Mozambicans have electricity. Uh, they've got gas. They can give us electricity. There's so much that can happen. And if we do not start in the interest of stabilizing the continent, we'll always have people coming to knock at the door. We'll never have peace. The United States ignoring of the Hispanic world, of Mexico, for an example. Yeah. They've got the largest, most powerful border control in the world. It hasn't saved them uh, from that particular immigration problem. Had the United States conceptualized its economic strategy, the way it did with its relationship with Canada, had it been, not been racist in relation to the Mexicans, there would be stability. There would be the same type of regional integration that you see in Europe, that you see in North America, uh, with, in relation to them, for an example, in Canada. So if, if the developmental trajectory is not in the interest of regional stability, uh, we're just living on a ticking time bomb. We've got to develop because our economic success in the immediate depends those factories producing products, not for ourselves, we're just 60 million as a small market. We can go into the continent, sell our products. There's still pro markets that will be open to South Africa, the Arab market, the Russian markets, uh, as well as some of the East Asian markets. They'll still be you know, willing to take products from South Africa. So you've, you've sparked some kind of debate on this question of a 2% economy of, of spaza shops and uh, uh, the, the chorus that you don't want to join of what so-called township uh, economy. And people are, are, are reading that to say, when we say is, is undermining spaza shops and he's saying, you know, let's leave, let's leave our, our spaza shops to other people while we, we go after banks and, and, and mines and, and, and so on and so forth. They say, but you, how, how do you just ignore that billion, over a billion rand uh, industry? First of all, let us underscore some facts. Um, 150,000 spaza shops in South Africa, accounting for 178 billion. A significant share of that 178 billion uh, that spaza shops account for is rent. Who's that rent going to in Soweto, in Mamilodi, uh, in the townships? It's going to South Africans. South Africans are the ones that are collecting rent from the Somalis, from the Pakistanis, and so on and so forth. It's a shared economy. What we must never allow is that that particular market must not be regulated. It must be regulated and people must not sell expired food. We must be very hard. And secondly, there must be documenting of anybody in South Africa. Because how else do you plan if you don't know how many people? That will be irresponsible. EFF is certainly for documentation. We've got to know who you are, where do you come from. And this documentation would, by the way, be very easy if there was regional cooperation and integration, because you wouldn't do crime here and run to Zimbabwe. We have your database. We would have a database of all Southern Africans, including their DNA database. We would be able to catch you anywhere and punish you for the crimes that you commit. But what we're saying is 4 trillion rands, 178 billion. From 1955, our people have always known townships are a spatial creation, a geospatial creation of the apartheid regime, to trap black people living on top of each other, overcrowded, fighting from the cramps that fall from the master's table. It's already a sign of landlessness. 
that you are abandoning the rest of the land to who? To 7% of the population. If there's going to be an economic success to the South African story, we've got to have a conversation about 178 billion minus 4 trillion rents. The rest of the economy still belongs to us. The banks, the land, which includes the mines, which includes the farms, and, and the entire economic activity. We have known that since 1955 in the Freedom Charter that for true equality to emerge, you've got to disarticulate the township, give our people land, so that there's no overcrowded of 80% of the population living in like 20% of the land. We can't accept that and we shouldn't be forced to accept that reality. Obviously, we believe in small and medium enterprises, but the small and medium enterprises of tomorrow under the EFF government are in charge, are engaged in the production of goods. So you know who's interesting in the townships? It's those mothers that are doing textile, who are doing curtains. Immediately when the EFF government takes over, those are the people who are going to give them school uniform contracts for them to do school uniform from the kids, for them to do the prison uniforms, for them to do the police uniforms, for them to do... We've got a small and medium enterprises plan. It is far larger than retail. It, is far, it has to do with the production in the mainstream of goods that are being consumed in the economy by government, by the rest of the consumers, and that can even get into the markets in the continent and the rest of the world. Let me appreciate you. Thank you very much for coming in. Thank you for having us. I hope that our people vote the EFF. And all